Hi, and welcome to the episode two of In Touch with iOS. I am your host, David Ginsburg, and... And I'm Melissa Davis. And we're back for a second episode. Yay! Yay! <laughs> we're here to talk about iOS, iPhone, iPad, and anything else that comes to our minds that relates to uh, our uh, fun that we have with all our technology. Um, in the last episode, we talked. I talked a little bit about all the hardware that I have, and uh, as I said, I have two iPads. I'm still crazy. And and a lot of other gadgets, but uh, Melissa, we didn't get to talk about the one thing that you were excited about, which was the Lightning USB camera adapter. Yeah, I just picked one up a little bit ago. Um, I'm gonna blog about this. This will be in a in a future thing that I'll talk about. But I actually did go up to Phoenix and I interviewed and spent some time with App Camp for Girls. Jean McDonald was yeah, here. Yeah. In Phoenix. That's lovely. yeah. So I took it up there with the intention that I was going to do like some video recording or, you know, do an audio recording. I even took my brand new microphone up. It just didn't happen for other reasons, but I was just happy to have it. It's just a new toy that that I can play with. And my son is really excited about it and <laughs> he wants to do a podcast with me. So maybe, you know what, sometime maybe we'll have him on the show and that'll yeah, be absolutely. I mean, I've already got thoughts of having other guests and, you know, the some surprises we'll have in future episodes. Um, yeah. Some other folks that might join us. And so we're definitely, we got, definitely got some great ideas to continue on with this, with this show. Yeah. So. so I'll put a link to the show notes in that. It's called the Apple lightning to USB three camera adapter. And what's interesting is I did get, there's two versions. There's one that is non powered and right. it's, you know, it's a couple bucks less. And I actually ended up getting the one that is powered. And I was glad that I did it because when I was yes. testing it, it turns out that uh, the microphone does use up a lot of battery. We've been going through ba- iPhone batteries like crazy around here lately. So we had invested, I think I talked about that last show where I invested in a battery pack that I purchased on meth.com. And one of these days it would be awesome if we got them as a sponsor because, oh my God, I'm starting to spend too much money on them. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> like, every day I open up the site, I go to meth.com and I'm thinking, please let it be something stupid that I won't buy. Please, please let it be something dumb. I have not gone there lately, but yeah, that is a don't do it. Don't do it, Dave. Uh, it's too late. I just did it. <laughs> <laughs> it's sold off for today. Oh darn! Uh, I don't. Yeah, they're wine wine canisters, uh, and I don't need that. So yeah, yeah. So. Actually, I think John, who got me out, was the one I was listening to John Gruber's. Uh, yeah, it's podcast. all Gruber's fault. Yeah, he he's all that. Uh, now the the real cool thing about the adapter is, and actually, again, I mentioned when I did my talk at Macstock, I did mention this this uh, uh, adapter course i have both <laughs> i had the old one and of course i had to buy the new one um if you if you only saw my bag of adapters i i you, yeah you'd be we need to do a what's in your bag segment yeah. like just take a picture for show notes and <laughs> show everybody all the gear this pouch i have has more adapters you could ever think of you um, know that's something i slacked off on this year when i went to max stock I'm, I'm kind of uh i'm set i'm upset at myself that i didn't do that because normally my method is when i pack I lay all of my stuff out on the bed and then I take a picture of it and I document like what it is that I pack so that I remember all the little pieces and stuff. Cause you'd think like as a girl, you'd think I'd have, you know, shoes mm-hmm. and makeup. I mean, I do have a little bit of makeup. I like my makeup, but it's my, my gadgets. It's all the, the cables and the gear and yeah. stuff that I travel with. And it's, it's just like, it's just like shoes in the way that you'll pack shoes that you never wear and for me, I don't like I pack a pair of sneakers and that's it because I'm just I'm a techie girl, but it's the gadgets. And I'm like, why am I packing this? I'm not going to use this, but like <laughs> I have to have it. It has to go in the bag. Absolutely. Well, the one thing with this adapter I will stress is um, it unofficially is supported by the iPhone, uh, but technically it's being aimed towards the iPad Pro. Now, the oh, iPad, why is that? Because it works fine on my iPad. Yeah, I don't know. Apple just doesn't is, didn't want to officially say that it works, but it does. Interesting. Um, so you can, with the iPad Pro 12.9 inch, which has the more more power than the 9.7 inch, it does uh, have a great uh, amount of power that you just you know plug in the adapter. So you power this adapter with the lightning connector and it plugs right into the power adapter. So now you can plug in a mic if you wanted to do a podcast from the iPad. Uh, we could be doing our podcast from this iPad right now if you really wanted to. Um, but the reason they called it the camera adapter was because, you know, you got the SD card that can be plugged in um, to it using an SD card uh, adapter. Um, and it gives power so you can it'd be much easier to sync, especially videos and photos. Because uh, before it, it would always say, oh, there's not enough power. 
you plug a thumb drive in there that has photos on it uh, or videos, it, it's just super fast. And because the iPad Pro 12.9 is so much faster, the download times for videos is just lightning fast. It's just super oh. fast. So you do That's get... Why they call it lightning. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. So um, so it th- th- if you go to Apple's website and the link will be on our show notes, it does specifically talk about the iPad Pro, but it does work with other... Uh, other older devices. Now, I don't know about the older iPads because they might not be as much power. Maybe the iPad Air 2. I haven't tried it. Fact, I, I will should. try it on my fourth gen. I haven't yet. I, I haven't tried it on the fourth gen, and I haven't tried it on my husband's iPhone 5S, but yeah. I will do that. I'll have to try it on. I have the, uh, my wife has the uh, Air 2 from my, my uh, uh, I gave that to her. Uh, so I'll have to try it on there. So, But and then the other thing, too, is that's another thing I, now I think about is the fact that if you wanted to be able to hook up uh, an Ethernet adapter that is USB to this, it works. Oh. So, so if you don't want to use Wi-Fi and you want to have a secure connection, oh, nice. you, can, you can use a, a, uh, a USB to Ethernet adapter that plugs into this adapter that's in power that that does provide you uh, some uh, wi- wired access. And some people, you know, tend to like to have that. So, uh, well, not so, only that, but I mean, if if you, I guess if. I imagine it would work if you were in such a place. Well, maybe airports. I don't remember if they had Ethernet jacks or not. But, yeah. you know, there are times where you just you do want to plug into Ethernet and it's just a hassle to go through the Wi-Fi and it's Absolutely. not stable and that sort of thing. So, wow, what a versatile little product. It's it is. Like, I'm, I'm glad I got it. So that, that'll be, and that'll be with uh, me all the time, whether I use it or not. <laughs> it is $39. That's how much it costs. Yeah, and- I usually do go cheap and I, I will sometimes look on Amazon for an alternative, but I really, for this particular product, I could not find anything that got good enough reviews. So I just bit it and I, I no. just got, you can't, never, never you can't resist the Apple adapters. I'm, I'm sorry to say so. They're blessed. They're, they're MiFi certified, I think is what you yeah. want to look for. <laughs> that's right. So that's the lightning adapter. So the other th- thing that we wanted to bring up that you brought up, I'm glad you did is the, uh, the new Apple TV remote app that was just released a couple days ago. Um, and, uh, you were getting a little excited about it. So was I, cause yeah. you, I was just using it on my fourth gen uh, Apple TV and it works. And great. I used it on my third gen and I used it on, Oh, you know what? I have to check. I do have a second gen and I need to check that one and see if that works, but I was able to use it on the third gen and the reason why I'm so excited about it is because I volunteer at my son's school and my my pet project has been to set up the Apple TVs and the iPads at the school. Right. Uh, they have they have lots of IT support, but they're all very much Windows. It's kind of a unfortunately, it's a bit of a hostile environment when it comes to Apple gear. Sure. And so they just don't have the knowledge. And this is what I used to do. And it's what I like to tinker with. So. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm a glutton for punishment. <laughs> so I've been trying to help the computer science teacher set up the Apple TVs on the network. And then interestingly enough, so I'm glad that they're beefing up the security, but it presents a challenge because now they want, they have to connect the iPads manually. They no longer have it that you can just look for the SSID and tap on it and then type in a password. It doesn't mm. work that way. So this is going to get kind of tricky. So either we're going to have to use Apple configurator. Now, luckily there's, there's only like, uh, there's about mm, not quite a dozen of these Apple TVs yet. So it's, it's a small amount, but I mean, that's still even six devices to plug in manually each time. And cause I've tried it with a hub and it doesn't really work too well. You might be able to do two maybe. Uh, but as you know, the Apple TV uses a, I think it's a micro uh, USB on the other end. Right. So you have to have a micro USB cable and so I just do one at a time. But if that's the case, I may have to build some Apple configurator profiles and install them. So that'll be an interesting adventure. I'll have to give you an update on that. Yeah. But the thing that I'm really excited about is before what was such a pain is with the old remote, which hasn't been updated in quite a while. And I'm talking about the iTunes remote app. That's the if you look at the icon, it's like a, a circle with a triangle in it. it's a blue and white icon. The new icon for the Apple TV remote app is just black and it looks just like an Apple TV. So that's handy. Uh, So we had been using the iTunes remote app on the teacher's phones. And, you know, you could use that with an an iPad. So in order to demonstrate how to use AirPlay and how to get connected, you must be on the same network. And what we had to do before was we had to jump through these hoops. We had to use home sharing. 
Right. And I'm not going to say it on air, obviously, but the the email address or the Apple ID that we're using, someone set it up a long time ago and it's super, super long. It's like over 30 characters. And so it was such a pain to type in. Now, I made a shortcut in my keyboard shortcuts, mm. which I should one of these days I would like to show you guys a tutorial on how to do that because, oh, my gosh, that is so handy. All I have to do is just type in three characters and it just inputs the whole entire long Apple ID in there. And then I just have to copy and paste the password that I have stored. So it was just a pain to have to have the teachers switch back and forth because, you know, they have their own Apple IDs, right? And so when they come onto campus, they have to switch to the school's Apple ID and connect to the school's network. Well, with the new Apple TV remote app, there's no more entering that Apple ID. Now, as long as you're on the same network, you just open up the remote section in the settings on Apple TV and you open up the app on your phone and it sees it. Like I said, they're on the same network and all you have to do is look for your phone in the list of remotes and then you click on it. You know, of course, you have to use the Apple remote that came with it. But then once you do that, you just enter the four digit pin that shows up and then it's paired and that's all you have to do. So, I mean, it's just, it's easy. Now what I do with the teachers is I have then there's so many darn remotes. That's the problem. There's just too many things to lose. There's too many things to keep track of. So I have paired their projector remotes with their Apple TVs so they can take that little silver remote and go stick it somewhere. And hopefully, <laughs> I mean, if it gets lost, it gets lost. We'll have to use another one. But uh, they can just use the same projector remote that comes with their projector to then pair their phone with it if they need to switch back and forth. So yeah. it just presents an interesting new simpler workflow. Now they didn't. You didn't look at something like uh, using AirPlay, where you could just AirPlay the uh, the iPad uh, to the screen. Yeah, you can do that. Again, they have to be on the same network, so that's what I want to do. But see, the the issue with so at this particular school, the problem was that they bought the teachers wireless keyboards, uh. and they were thinking that they could just oh well they'll use them with the projectors, and they were thinking they could use them with the Apple TVs. But I guess somebody didn't do enough research because it turns out these wireless keyboards, the way that they work is they have a proprietary Wi-Fi dongle. They're not actually Bluetooth. Okay. They connect via a proprietary Wi-Fi sim signal that gets plugged into the back of their PC mm -hmm. and it does not communicate with the Apple TV at all. So where the remote comes in handy is then they can have keyboard support. So let's say you're a teacher and you're, or just anybody, you're giving a presentation and you want to go to a YouTube video or a Flickr or whatever on one of the Apple TV apps and you want to do a search, you can just use your iPhone and it'll just, it'll actually buzz. What's really nice is it buzzes. It gives you tactile feedback and it buzzes right in your hand right. as soon as the text field becomes available. And then you can just use the keyboard right on the screen on your iPhone. So it's just, it's super handy for that sort of thing. You can just use it as a remote. You can use it to enter text and away you go. So gotcha. I just, I'm really so, excited about it. So one of the other things I'll add, and again, because you haven't had a fourth gen yet, is it has Siri built into the app. So all you have to do is there's a oh. microphone um, icon. You push the microphone down, icon down, hold on to it, and you can speak into the phone and, uh, and talk to Siri to navigate uh, the, the fourth gen. Uh, oh, Apple nice. TV, so that's pretty slick. So I'm pretty excited. I'm glad Apple, uh, uh, with the requirements they did, they did, uh, they did, uh, they are supporting three of the four generations of the Apple TV, and that's pretty awesome. Yeah, so they, they, did, they really didn't have to, um, didn't have to do that, and they, and they did. So as long as I'm really glad they do, because in schools especially, they hang on to the older equipment, and sometimes they don't have a budget for the newer equipment, so they'll right. either get the older equipment or they'll just have it forever and ever. So it's good that they support that legacy stuff because that's it's in play in a lot of places. Absolutely. So yeah, go grab it. It's free, which is awesome. We love free, and uh, we'll have that link in the show notes. Uh, it also is you just uh, go to the uh, the app store on the iPhone or the iPad for that matter. Um, yep, I'm gonna do a search for Apple TV Remote, and you can still use the iTunes Remote app. Right. And the difference between the two, though, so I did look at this. Uh, if you want to use your uh, AirPlay speakers or like we have an old G5 that's hooked up that we use as a media center mm -hmm. and we can play our music from like kind of it's like when you play DJ, you know, mm -hmm. and each of us can use the older remote still. So I hope that they don't get rid of that. I hope that this is not a replacement for that because you to my knowledge, you can't use it to play your music. So you still have to use the iTunes remote app for that particular functionality. So have them both have them both on, on your no. iPhone. Just just to make sure, I just mentioned about the iPad. It, it is a 
iPhone designed remote. So oh, you have so to, it's scale. You have to go in. Yeah, you'll have to scale it. So you'll have to set it to iPhone only when you search for it in the App Store, which I just did. And uh, yeah, it'll be a little tiny. You just scale it. Mm, good be, to know. Yeah, because if you want to use it on your iPad, and you don't have your iPhone, you can use it. So I think that's all we can say about the remote. But go grab it. Um, the next topic we want to talk about is a touch a little more on iOS 10 beta. The uh, beta 5 just came out actually to, as we record this uh, today, on um, August 9th. Uh, so there's there's some uh, a bunch of new things that were added. Uh, it looks like they've added just a couple of few features. So I could just review a little bit here. Uh, I guess there was a problem with the smart battery case that came goes with the iPhone 6 and 6S, and I guess it'll now work properly, according to the release notes. The case will no longer cause devices to panic. <laughs> must have had some problems don't, don't panic. there. Um, the photos, uh, Apple plans to uh, reprocess facial recognition data in Beta 5, so all named, favorited, and merged face data will be reset. Okay, that's not good, because that means if you have all those... Uh, photos set with your with the recognized faces you might have to reset that but that's oh my what gosh. that's what happens when you do beta software <laughs> i'm glad i didn't touch it because i do i do do a lot of facial recognition uh the lock sound there's a, a new sound when locking the iphone it sounds like a door closing oh, okay that's, really that's, that's, that's exciting a- i haven't tried again i don't have it on my iphone i only have it on a second ipad here so uh, new output icon is uh, is the new, uh, the output icon seen in the control center. Uh, the music app and other locations in iOS have been slightly tweaked. It's no longer represented by headphones and instead rep- re- uh, resembles a triangle with uh, sound waves. I see that. Ooh. Interesting. Exciting. Uh, the home section uh, in the settings app has been removed hmm. on the iPhone hmm. as it served no purpose, but still remains on the iPad. I better guess I should check that. Uh, widgets. There's a new widgets panel. Uh, Accessible by swiping to the right, and now displays uh, the data on all devices. Okay, cool. And the Swift Playgrounds, which is uh, I'm pretty excited about that because uh, that's uh, Me too. That, that's a playground where people where the kids are able to learn how to code. If you, if, if anybody watched the the World Wide Developers Conference back in June, uh, they demonstrated that, and it's just so cool uh, how these kids, you know, you nine year old kids are coding. My ten year old is really excited about it. We yeah. can't wait. So you, it, it's it's in there. I I kind of took a peek and uh, yeah, it's it's pretty slick. So, um, so that was that was just released. And and again, iOS uh, ten beta is not for the faint of heart. Don't don't do it. Don't do it if you uh, <laughs> if you uh, uh, don't want to. Experience I don't have a faint of heart, but I'm not even doing it. <laughs> yeah, if you don't want to experience any problems. So uh, I definitely recommend uh, just uh, waiting until it's released. They're saying it's probably going to be released in September. Um, along with that, as I know, there's some more rumors about the iPhone uh, 7 that's going to possibly be coming out. September um, can't come fast yeah, enough. Yeah, uh, we're just we're, we're just waiting. Apple, we we need we need new stuff. It's been too yeah. long. There's just all this sitting all these, on the edge. All the Macs have been a couple years old. And, I've got um, clients lined up, ready to buy stuff. Yeah, <laughs> and, and then the iPhone uh, 7 is uh, a couple. Take I guess, that touch, quarterly report. <laughs> I could touch upon some of the rumors. I mean, obviously, we talked about it last time. Um, is the 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 removal of the headphone jack and it's gonna, that's going to be the, the lightning connector is going to be for the for headphone another adapter to carry around um and uh and the camera i think it's going to be a, a much advanced camera so but other than that i haven't seen it t- to be too exciting so i be surprised if not a lot of people are going to upgrade right off the bat i uh, wish so. that they would announce waterproofing i would that would really make a lot of people happy oh there's my meatloaf <laughs> excuse me one moment Oh man, it smells so good. Yeah, <laughs> meatloaf. Podcasting in the time it takes to do a meatloaf. Almost. <laughs> about iOS. Uh, oh, the uh, iPhone seven. Okay. Are you? Are you? Do you think you want to get one, or are you going to wait? Or know. we'll see. You, I'm, you, I'm, you I've usually been, live on the bleeding edge. There. I've been resistant for that. I resisted the Mac, so I'm resisting. Uh, I may have to resist this too. We'll see. So. I'm on the S cycle, so I'm I'm hesitant myself as far as upgrading. But it's one of those things where my dad's kind of on the fence of upgrading, and I'm kind of going to try to maybe push him to get one. Go ahead, Dad. You get one, so I can play with it. <laughs> so uh, you know, I'll get it, and then I'll send it out to him all set up. <laughs> <laughs> That's my my dream anyway. I can dream, right? Yes, you can. So uh, let's talk a little bit about security. 
um, there, there was a, a good article that that, that uh, Melissa found. Uh, and it's in the show notes uh, relating to this is what Apple should tell you when you lose your iPhone. I don't know if you, I, I, I look through this uh, article and it, it's kind of scary, scary the way people can really use social engineering to really make people give information they shouldn't, uh, uh, they should, they shouldn't be doing. I mean, it just happened today. Somebody came to our door this morning and said that they wanted to look at our ComEd bill, which is the local electric, electric carrier here, saying that uh, they wanted to look to see if you're being charged for wind. Like the, like yeah. the wind the stuff, you know, like the wind. And I, can you get, give me your bill? I want to see it. I'm like, wow, really? I want to give you my bill so you can look at my personal information and, and you can hack into anything. Wow. So that's just things you got to watch for. And I think this is exactly the other re- reason, if you wanted to touch upon it. that's Yeah. So it's, it's scary for me in particular because I work with seniors and I see all of the stuff all the time. I see how easily they, they can get scammed. And I mean, the kind of work that, and you probably experienced this too, but mm-hmm. I mean, people are, can be a little too trusting at times. They can and be. I really try to educate them. And it's hard because there's always that balance between convenience and security. And most people will always pick convenience. And I'm always getting articles from my clients. They'll always, you know, text me or email me an article about something scary, you know. And I, I really I don't like the the fear mongering uh, way about it. That's why I really appreciated this article because it didn't just it wasn't like fear mongering. It was like, hey, uh I'm actually pretty, you know, savvy and, you know, an expert in this kind of stuff. And I almost got fooled. You should read the article. It's it's uh, from Hacker Noon is the source. And the That's title nice. of it is, This is What Apple Should Tell You When You Lose Your iPhone. I should go and see if I can find the, I'll find the link that I wrote on my blog. Because I've actually been through this scenario, not once, but twice. My husband has had two of his iPhones stolen in the, the last couple of years. And I got both of them back. So it does have a happy ending. The first one I did get back, I got back within 40, within 24 hours. I mean, it wasn't, it didn't take very long. Uh, we were able to, I'll tell you the story some other time on another show mm-hmm. when we talk about it. And I would like to talk about it in more depth, um, but we did get it back. The second one took about six months and I just basically just didn't give up. The phone was wiped, uh, but I didn't wipe it remotely. Like I didn't use the wipe remotely function, I put it into lost mode, which locked it. And then long story short, when I got it back, whoever tried to hack it or try to make it their own, they wiped it. So none of our data was ever like exposed or anything. And my husband does use a passcode lock and everything. So I didn't worry about the data, but it was a very interesting adventure seeing how many hands that phone changed. It it went through middle school, went through two middle schools. (laughs) Kids had stolen it and they were passing it around and you know, just like, oh, look, I have an iPhone. I can take pictures. They couldn't do anything with it because it has it has activation lock on it. But it's interesting because um, right. that is a very, very scary thing when you're going through that and you get a message that says, hey, I found your iPhone, you know, and it's just like, oh, my gosh, you know, your heart starts beating and you start breaking into like a cold sweat. Like, oh, my gosh, it's alive. It's alive. And, you know, you, you want to go get it. Meanwhile, you've already replaced it or, or whatever. Uh, you've already said goodbye to it. And so when you get that message that it's actually been found, your heart skips a beat. And so I could really, really relate with the emotional discussion that this person wrote about their experience. It was really great. I encourage you to read the article. The basic takeaway, the TLDR, if if you don't want to read the whole thing, is basically just adopt a policy that don't that you don't click on any links, no matter who it's from, because it can look very convincing. We used to be able to tell people that all you had to do was look really close and you could see, you could really see glaring mistakes in the efforts that people would, these hackers would make to contact you. You could see that the logo was kind of off or there was spelling mistakes throughout. I mean, you could, to a trained eye, you could really see the difference. Now, to most people, like my seniors, they would probably fall for it. And one of my seniors actually did fall for an Amazon scam. Mm -hmm. So I had to go in and kind of like rescue her and help her out with that. But uh, it's not a matter of, I always say to people nowadays, and and it's sad, but it's true. It's not a matter of if you will get hacked, but when you will get hacked. And you need to know what to do about it. So in future episodes, I would like to kind of have like a little security spot where we can focus on what to do or how to protect yourself and that sort of thing. So for our first uh, doling out of advice here, I would say that just don't click on a link. Don't tap on a link. If you use it as a notification 
Now, in this, in the cases of this, you know, the person's phone was stolen or you know, lost or misplaced, and uh, he was given information saying how to how to claim it. You always want to go directly to the source. Like if it's if you're getting a notification from your bank or from some some healthcare provider, anything that asks you, you know, there's kind of like rules that you should follow that just apply to everything. One of those rules is if they ask you to click on something that then takes you to a place where you need to provide any kind of login credentials, uh, be aware of that. I would just not click on the link. And if you get any kind of instruction that says click here, that you that then further explains that it's going to take you to a place where it's going to ask you to log in, I would just avoid it altogether and just go directly to the source and just say, oh, gee, my bank is telling me that I need to go log in and check this out. So you know what? Thanks for the information. And I'm just going to go directly to the source and either go to their website, log in how you normally do, and just see if that's actually a legitimate claim. So it's all about critical thinking and you know inspecting that claim for what it is. So I just wanted to touch upon that and we'll go into security in more depth in other episodes. But that was yeah. that was a biggie that I really want people to read, take a look at, because this is an example of just how crafty the hackers have gotten and they're really making it realistic. I mean, I didn't find any mistakes that I saw that were glaring. The only thing that I did see that I that I would point out now, see, I'm a classically trained and typesetter. That's what I used to do for a living. So there's things that I can't unsee. Like I can't unsee spaces extra spaces in between text. So right. when I look at the artwork that was presented in this particular hack, the only thing that jumps out in, in my eyes is that there's a space in between the end of the sentence and a period and a, um, a question mark. And I thought, eh, that's not something Apple would do. So that threw me off a little bit. They're usually pretty tight, neat and tidy with their typography. So <laughs> that was the only thing that I noticed. But I mean, that's really tiny in comparison to the rest of it. The rest of it was like really crafted really well. So... Yeah, now I'll definitely add uh, just just be vigilant. Don't 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 give out your passcode. Don't uh, don't go to websites you shouldn't go to. I highly recommend because Apple now, when you first set up your phone, um, that you have a um, a five digit pin uh, or six digit pin instead of instead of a four. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's a good idea to do that because it's. I know I always get people complain. Oh, I don't. I want to. You're forcing me to do six. I want to do four. I mean, you, you can so you can you can change it. But I think it's such a great idea to have the more characters, the better when it comes to keeping your device secure. So definitely. But uh, that that's uh, that was some good good info, and then uh, definitely stay on top of uh, keeping your life secure with your your iOS device. Um, next topic we want to talk about is uh, what is it that most of us do with our iOS devices? Um, I know Melissa, you you had a lot of great ideas of, of thinking. Of, I, must, I think a lot of the things that we do is it's it's not it's not talking on your phone. It's uh, <laughs> it's, it's photos and a lot of other things. And you had some great, great ideas I wanted to, to, to talk about here. Yeah, the uh, phone is like the least, the, the app that I use the least. <laughs> so just a few minutes ago, my timer went off. So one of the things that I used it for, <laughs> especially today, is I have meatloaf in the oven and I needed to, it just kind of worked out this way that my husband took the kids to the Y and, you know, he said, can you please put, you know, he texted me and gave me instructions. So I should, I should uh, lead in with that, that it's no secret that I am not the cook in this family. <laughs> so I can take <laughs> and I, and no I thought you credit. Were. <laughs> no, I can take no credit for this amazing meatloaf that is wafting through the house right now. It's mm. all hubby all the time. He's, in fact, the kids have nicknamed it, they call it meat love because he makes it with love. You know, we always say, oh, your hands taste good. <laughs> <laughs> so he has made this delicious meatloaf and he needed just me to pop in the oven and uh, I'll, I'll admit it, he did actually have to remind me to take the plastic wrap off first because <laughs> oh I have a, a – <laughs> <laughs> I did that a long time ago before we were even married and like I'll never live it down. I I put something plastic in the oven. I just wasn't thinking. I don't know what, what I was thinking. It just wasn't. And so it melted and it – oh, my God. It was – we weren't even married. We weren't even together. And I should have never, ever told him that. I should never even be telling you about this. But I am. So so that is what my iPhone is really helpful for, is my husband giving me instructions on how to feed our family with the meatloaf that he made and how to put it in the oven, you know, the degrees and what to set it for. Like it, and very specific instructions. It's uh, My iPhone is basically my brain. It, it is my second brain. Um, I do live with a chronic illness called fibromyalgia, which does cause a lot of like cognitive decline at times. You can't tell because I'm usually like very caffeinated when I do these things. But there are times when I get very forgetful. I get like uh, what's called fibro fog. I get really kind of foggy and 
I have towards the end of the day. I could never do this like later at night after the kids have worn me out because I then get to a point where I'm just using like two, three word sentences. <laughs> so my iPhone really helps me just basically do life. It helps me do business. I do a lot of work from bed a lot of times. Um, I schedule appointments with clients. I take a lot of pictures. I just do yeah. tons and not just pictures of my kids. I mean, I have little kids. So, you know, by default, I just take a lot of pictures and videos and live photos and stuff. But I do a lot of documentation. I take lots of pictures of, say, for instance, text that I can't read. So for one example that I do a lot with clients when I go to their home uh, and I help them set up routers and things like that, a lot of that text is so darn tiny. And so I'll take a picture. I just was was guiding a client through it just today, in fact, and she was texting me and I was giving her instructions. You know, she lives a couple states away. This is a remote client. And I'm giving her instructions on how to find the password to her to her router. And I gave her instructions on taking a picture. And so she knows how to text. And so she sent me the picture. And I'm like, nope, it's not that label. You know, I'm going to flip it over and look at this label. And then she finally found it. And, you know, so now she can take that text and zoom in and she can see what those what those digits are to be able to type in that password. So lots and lots of pictures, lots of documentation. Like I said, scheduling appointments. I use the calendar. I love it when a client will say, you know, we'll over text with what time, what date works for you. And they'll text me back a date and a time. And all I have to do is just tap on that and it makes a calendar appointment for me right away. So I use the yeah. scheduling, the calendar a lot. I hear a lot of people talk about lots of different apps and I think that's wonderful. A lot of people like to use things like BusyCal and I use for calendaring on the iOS platform. I use calendars five. I just thought of that's so all put a link to that in the show notes. That's my favorite non-stop calendar app. It just does a lot more of what I need. But I do like the fact that the calendar is built in. So I would never hide, you know, I hide that app in a folder in the back, but I use it for the native built-in kind of stuff. This is why I'm really excited that Apple opens up the APIs to developers because yeah. maybe I can start using non-native apps to maybe use Siri to input things and stuff like that. So and I'm excited about that. And I definitely would hit on Siri. Siri has just become an, an incredible resource. Um, I, I just watched a, another podcast the other day, and they talked about what Siri really can do, and it's just it's amazing. You can do your scheduling. You can you know look up math problems. I mean, it just Siri has become just just a incredibly powerful tool. And there's a lot of things that a lot of people don't know it can do. Um, I use it when I'm taking a bath. Like I'll use it to play music and yeah. I'll use it. To, I actually use it to text. I'll ask one of the kids or my husband like, hey, can you bring me the, <laughs> the silly things that I do with it? Yeah, no, but, exactly. And, uh, it's just, and it is it is very silly. And uh, I don't actually get to use Siri as much as I would like to in the home because my kids actually take advantage of it and they'll, they'll try to interrupt me. And I mean, they're, they're six and 10. So for them, the novelty hasn't quite worn off yet and they just love using Siri. So I use it in the car a lot. I use it in hands-free mode. I have a 13 year old car, so my car is very old, wow. but it, you know, having Siri in an iPhone keeps me modern, you know, it keeps me with the time. So I don't have, you know, CarPlay and things like that, but I have Siri on my phone and I can use it to, I mean, I don't, recommend texting while driving, but I can use it to text while driving if I need to. Like I usually will, when I'm on my way to a client, I'll text them when I'm at a stop late or something when I'm about, about 15 minutes out, just so that they know when to expect me. So I'll just, you know, say something really simple and I'll text the person and say, you know, I'm on my way, I'll see you soon. And, you know, it's just really easy and quick and safe to do that. Uh, but I'll use it to control podcasts and, you know, pause and play and rewind and fast forward and, uh, especially driving directions. Uh, I do prefer to use Google Maps for that. However, I like the Siri integration. Again, I'm excited for the API releases because I'm hoping that I'll be able to do something similar with Google right. Maps that I can do with Apple Maps. A lot of times if I'm just you know driving to clients locally and things like that, I will actually choose Apple Maps over Google Maps simply because I want to be able to listen to podcasts while I'm driving and there's a difference. So when the voice comes on to tell you when the turns are in Google Maps, it ducks the volume, which means it just makes it sit softer. So when you're really trying to pay attention to someone who is talking like we are right now, you might miss something and then you'll have to rewind. You know, it's just kind of a pain. Whereas Siri and Apple Maps integration, 
is such that when the voice comes on, she will actually pause the recording. And what's nice about it, I think this might be a new feature in in one of the last couple of releases. I noticed Mm -hmm. that they will actually they're really good about rewinding just like a, you know, like a nanosecond or two, like just just a like a half a second before or after where they muted it. So when you're trying to listen to something, you'll actually hear the last like couple of words repeated, which is really, really nice. So I really like that. So what I end up having to do is one of the reasons that I like Apple Maps over Google Maps for when I'm listening to stuff is the fact that I can say, I won't say it, but I'll, I'll invoke the command and I'll say, what's my next turn? Because the thing that I prefer about Google Maps over Apple Maps for when I'm doing some hardcore traveling is I like how it notifies you. And it tells you which lane to get in and it and it tells you within a timely manner where you're going to turn. Whereas Apple Maps, you know, it's like, all right, where, where's my turn? Because here it is. And oh, I missed it. So it, it doesn't tell you within enough time. It waits until you're on top of the turn. So I like to ask Siri ahead of time, where is my next turn? And so I've kind of sort of compensated oh, for that. I never thought of doing that. That's a great idea. Because, <laughs> well, if you had the Apple Watch, you would have... <laughs> It would have the, the taptic feedback on your wrist that the turn is coming. So Oh, I see. Does it work for you as far as, does it wait until you're on top of the turn or, no, or does it give you no, enough it, notice? It gets close it just, and then it just, I start feeling a tap location. on my wrist. Yeah, it's probably just location like around here. I just noticed that. And it, I noticed it when we did our, our cross country trip uh, the previous summer. My husband was like, all right, come on, check, come on, check. Where, uh, where am I going to turn? He was getting really anxious about it because it wasn't, it wasn't updating as quickly as it needed to. So you kind of have to uh, compensate for that a little bit. Yeah, you know, hopefully maybe they'll, maybe they'll update that. Is, I, I don't know. Are there any of those things that you've noticed in the beta yet? Um, no, not, nothing that stands out. I haven't spent a lot of time with the beta. I mean, I have it on the machine on the iPad Pro 9-7 inch, um, mm-hmm. but I haven't noticed too much yet. You know, well, that's make, something I'll be looking time. for. I'll yeah, be looking for. I have definitely. a wish list. That's going on my wish list. Definitely. Speaking of lists, uh, that's another thing that I do with my phone. Yeah. And I have a link to this is uh, an app that we all use in the family called Grocery Gadget. Mm-hmm. And my gosh, we've been using this for years now. And it's interesting. We just now uh, put it on my son's phone because he's 10 now and he's wanting to start, you know, he has more responsibilities and he has his own ideas about how he wants to help out. And so one of his little tasks that he can now do is we can say, hey, you know, hey, Lucian, will you add this to the grocery list? And he'll open up his phone and then he can do it. And it syncs to all of our phones. So, yeah, while we're while we're shopping, I can actually see like if I'm at home and my husband's doing the grocery shopping because he's the, he's the foodie in the family. Mm-hmm. Uh, he'll be adding stuff and I, I can say, oh, you know, I'll text him and I'll let him know. And I'll say, oh, I added this to the list and he'll go and open up the list and then it will refresh and it'll load the items that that he put in there. And <laughs> yeah, this looks like a great app. I oh, it's, it's fun. <laughs> My husband does something really funny with it. I have to tell you about this without without getting into too much detail. <laughs> he has played little practical jokes on me while I'm out shopping and he'll put something in the list that I don't expect to be there. And I'll just let you use your imagination as to what <laughs> that means. <laughs> I don't even want to know. <laughs> That's really something fun that you can do Ooh, with, a, with a grocery shopping list. Now it looks like <laughs> <laughs> with that, I said, look, it looks like the app is free, um, but there, it looks uh, there's an in-app purchase you can buy a yearly subscription. Yeah. Did you buy that? I think if you don't get it, you just get ads, and so I okay. I can usually look past that. It's not that big of a deal. But I've been using it so long, and I've been supporting it for so long, and the developer. I haven't written to them in a while, but when I did write to the developer about questions, they usually got back to me pretty quickly. So mm. I'll probably throw a couple bucks their way and just pay for the subscription when, when it when it needs to be on my phone. Great. But yeah, we, we really enjoy it. So that's really, really helpful. So I love making lists on my phone. I uh, use my banking app. Um, yeah, whatever too. bank you have, it probably by now there's an app for that. Absolutely. So I do a lot of banking on my phone, which I really, really enjoy. Deposit I like the checks. touch ID. Love yep, it. I deposit checks. Yep, it's it's just absolutely awesome. Um, we use our phones a lot for parenting. Uh, like I just said, you know, I set a timer for the meatloaf. I also set timers for the kids. Going back to Siri again, I make Siri play bad cop. Because I'll I'll say I won't say the the command because I don't want to set off our phones, but I'll say the yeah, command. Yeah, yeah. I'll say set a timer, you know, for five minutes or twenty minutes or whatever whatever we decide it's going to be, 
and the kids have to listen to Siri dole it out instead of mom, you know? So that's kind of fun. Uh, so I set a lot of timers with it. I'm always, instead of doing countdowns, it, it just gets to be a monotonous after a while. And then we have another app that we've been using for many, many years is called I Allowance. And I put a link to that. It's a chore charting app. And it's more than that, though, because it actually teaches kids about finances. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it can be as simple or as complicated as you want it to be. And I have it, you know, for my kids, there's there's a freer age gap between them. So for my six year old, I have a very simplistic like he just basically gets stars and sad faces. Um, it's just kind of either good behavior or bad behavior. And we use that as because when you tap on it, it makes this like ching noise. Or if you you know use a sad face, it makes this buzzer noise. It's very Pavlovian. If you've ever studied Pavlov and Pavlov's dogs, it's you know a psychological reaction that the dogs would get whenever a bell would ring. They they come running. So I use it like that to kind of train my train my kids for their behavior. But then my older son, he's ten, and he is starting to learn how to do things like manage his birthday money and gift cards. And he's really excited. Like he loves to go to Starbucks. We had, you know, we got him a Starbucks card for his birthday and we put it on his phone and he likes to be able to buy a treat, you know, with daddy when he takes him. It's like their mm -hmm. special little date time. So the app helps keep track of that kind of stuff. It's kind of like a banking app in and of itself that we can manage the balances for all that kind of stuff. And so they know when they get a deduction that it's being taken off of either their screen time. It'll track multiple things. It'll track time. It'll track money. It will track uh, just stars. Like you can say, okay, one star is worth a penny if that's what you want to do. Uh, so it'll track multiple things for you. And so it'll deduct and it'll show you a record of all that. And so that's another great, a great app that I use. So parenting, parenting and discipline, you know, all, all with this, this thing that I hold in my hand, you know, I awesome. wield. I, I don't just hold my iPhone. I wield my iPhone. <laughs> looks like it looks like another great app, and uh, it is uh, three ninety nine, which is not too terribly expensive. And uh, it looks like it got a lot of great reviews. So, for anybody looking for uh, allowance manager, chore charting, that's a that's a, that's a great app. Great suggestion. I jump gap software. In fact, I did a review on it. I'll put that link in the show notes too. I have that there. And it was a while ago. It was from 2013. Like I said, yeah, been using it for okay. a long, long time. It's still topical. Uh, it's still, you know, it's still relevant. I've gone back and looked at it and yeah, you know, there's, there's been some changes. The syncing is a little bit better and stuff like that. But for the most part, it still stands. So absolutely I live, I live in that app. There's, there's things that, you know, are just on that front page that, you know, we just use all the time. But, uh, and then, uh, Moving on to uh, some of the things that we want to do better with our iOS devices. You, you put that question out there. I think you had it out on Facebook and Twitter talking yeah. about a, uh, a way to get your photos off of your, uh, off of your iPhone uh, very easily. And I, and I suggested, and I bought this device, and actually I suggested it to one of, one of my bosses, and he, he ended up buying it too. He loved it. Um, he, oh. uh, and and uh, this is from SanDisk. It's called the iExpand flash drive. And what it is is it, it allows you to be able to, uh, hook up through the lightning connector. You just pull this little tab up, and and you plug that into the to the to the iPhone or the iPad. And they have an app that you download, and it allows you to manipulate and download all the fo all the photos onto these particular drives. And it's like a USB thumb drive. It's got a USB 2.0, I believe it is, uh, connector on it. So then you can turn around, and once you've downloaded all the photos onto this device, uh, you can plug it into your computer, whether it be a PC or or a Mac, and uh, and copy them back over, and that's a great way of backing it up. And it comes in a bunch of different sizes. I think the lowest is 16 gig, and I probably wouldn't even waste my time buying that. Right. Um, yep. So I would get, I think the one I bought was 32, which was a nice sweet spot, but it does have a 64 and 128. Mm -hmm. um, and it, and you can also set it to do an automatic backup. When you plug it in, the app will actually go through and uh, provide a automatic backup to provide you the backup uh, of all your photos because, you know, you never know what happened. You can, as much as we want to trust iCloud and make sure that it's backing up all our photos, you know, you never know what would happen. And it, it just, this gives you another place to have a backup. And this backs up videos and photos. Um, so it's a, it's a great little device. And uh, the other thing, too, too, is you can actually plug this into the computer and being able to plug any other type of app on there, whether it be like maybe a PDF file or something else beyond the, those types of files. And you could password protect it as well. It's got a 
It's got a built-in uh, security, so in case this thing ever gets lost or stolen, you can uh, it could be protected. So, uh, you, you didn't. I assume you did not purchase it as of yet, right? Not yet, because I was actually eyeing up the new version of it. So okay. I'm I'm actually really lusting after that right now. The oh, new version. This. Yeah, take a look at that. I I actually I highly oh, recommend that you go check that out the website. Sexy thing. <laughs> oh, isn't it though? Because that was my question when you first texted me the picture. I was like, yeah. "Oh my god, it's really wide." <laughs> it is. And I just I pictured like plugging this thing in and thinking, "Oh, it's going to take up other ports. It's going to occlude the other ports. What if I it's I need to have other things plugged in?" Drive. Isn't it sexy? Yes. Oh my gosh! I know I want one so badly. And it's got so the same that's, sizes. That's going on my oh, Christmas list. <laughs> and it's a USB three, which just makes it even yep. faster. So yeah, well, I bought this one a couple like, years ago. So yeah, they think that yeah, things might be upgraded. Time to, uh, upgrade. Uh, don't let my wife so my, <laughs> my major question that I haven't gotten answered yet, that I'm still looking forward to finding out for sure, and I think it may be yes, but I want to confirm, is I want to find out if you can record video directly to this thing. So let me just mm. explain the use case scenario. This goes back to sure. volunteering at school again. So the issue that I was having um, last year for my son's kindergarten teacher, and this happens for a lot of teachers, my husband may actually be going through this process soon too, um, what happens is teachers can go through an evaluation process and that involves, it's very lengthy and it's very time consuming. It can be very frustrating because mm -hmm. it involves a lot of videoing. And what happens is the teachers need to have their instruction time videoed and then they need to take that video and submit it to evaluators. Well, sometimes like one time we tried it and um, instead of doing like little chunks of segments, she said, well, let's just try recording like a whole segment instead of individual ones. And it was like a 20 minute lesson. And that 20 minute video even, and it wasn't, it's not like I'm shooting 4k or anything. Uh, it, it ended up being over four gigabytes just for that one 20 minute file. Yep. And so, you know, you figure all of these video files are going to add up and add up and add up. And so what was happening was, I mean, I have a 64 gigabyte iPhone. Now at the time I hadn't had this, but now things have changed. So if I'm going to be volunteering and doing more videoing, I have to make this consideration because I have made the choice now to put all 40,000 pictures on my iPhone. <laughs> I now yeah. live with 40 grand, you know, of, of pictures and, you know, a couple hundred videos that are in the cloud. And while the iCloud does, it does optimize the storage on your phone, it still takes up quite a chunk of space. So yeah. I've only got about seven gigs of free space that I can you know, kind of work with at any, any given time. And so if I'm going to continue to do this volunteering, I need to find a different solution. I can't be constantly having these, these videos hogging up all the space on my phone. So I need to find a way to offload that quickly. And but, so what I had been doing was I would record a couple of videos and then I would lug my 15 inch MacBook pro, which I love, don't get me wrong, but mm -hmm. I would lug it onto campus. And then I would have to plug in uh, a 32 gigabyte SD uh, thumb drive that I have. And I'd have to plug in my phone and then use image capture and take the video and then copy it to the, to the, uh, now this is a micro SD card on a thumb drive. So the write speeds weren't that great. So it was taking a while, you know, I'd have to copy it onto the drive. Sometimes it was actually faster if I just copied it to my SSD and then transferred it to the thumb drive, but you know, neither here nor there. So, you know, it's just this time consuming process. And then I'd have to eject the drive and then plug it into the teacher's PC. Now, some of you may be scratching your head. Well, gee, Melissa, why didn't you just plug your iPhone into the teacher's PC? Well, let me tell you why. <laughs> because <laughs> these are older machines. Uh, they're running anywhere from Windows 10, 8 to 10 on them. And I did do it one time. But what was happening was the experience was not consistent. One time I was able to plug in my phone and then it just took forever. It, like it took a while right. to recognize the phone and then it wanted to launch iTunes. And, you know, I don't like the idea of plugging in my personal device on a school network. I mean, it's it just it's iffy. You know, I'd rather use the the devices. I'd rather use the hardware that's there on the network that's kind of blessed by the network and IT and that sort of thing. I just didn't like the idea of like mixing my stuff in with theirs. And especially like my personal device, you know, I just, I just don't know. I mean, plugging it into a PC, it just kind of gave me the heebie-jeebies. So oh I didn't God. like that idea. I didn't, you know, it worked one time. I tried to do it again. It wasn't a consistent experience. I Then it asked me if I wanted to install some kind of video player. And I was like, oh my gosh, my, my blood pressure was just like through the roof. I was like, <laughs> this is just not, no, I'm not doing this. So 
I ended up having to do that extra work around and like bring my Mac in and plug it in and copy and do all this stuff. So I was looking for like, there's got to be an easier way. There's got to be a better way to do this. And so that's why I started digging and I started, you know, asking people on Facebook. And so people have been giving me ideas and one person pointed to this and then you pointed to it. And I'm like, oh, okay. So people seem to like this. There is another product. Um, I forget what the name of it is, but it's, it's a, probably the competitor. It does cost quite a lot less for the same kind of functionality. And in fact, it does actually have one of the questions is, um, whether or not you can charge your iPhone while you have this thing plugged into your computer and you're transferring data. And the answer is no, not on the iXpand flash drive, right. but on this other product uh, you can. However, it all boils down to the app and the development that they have behind this thing and, and how they're supporting it. And the SanDisk iXpand flash drive, everybody seems to love the app and the developers are really behind it and supporting it. I've looked at the app and they're updating it pretty frequently. And I will just say that I, I do recommend that you go check out the website. We're going to post the link to the show notes because it's just, they have really cute videos. And, you know, from my personal, I'm, I'm biased because I'm a mom. They are marketing this thing to moms. Yeah. I have to say the the videos that they have are like totally geared towards <laughs> moms because we take a lot of pictures and a lot of videos. You know, I just attended a birthday party and I took videos and because we moms, we look out for each other because when you're hosting the birthday party, that's the thing you forget because like you're cutting the cake and you're busy like trying to, you know, host the party and do all those responsibilities. And then you forget to take the pictures and then you get home and you're like heartbroken. You're like, I don't have any pictures of my kid blowing out the candles. And then thank God there's other moms that do that. And so we're always trading files and so I could totally see this at birthday parties where you're like, here, I just, you know, took a bunch of videos and pictures and plug it into the other person's phone and off you go. So, yeah, yeah. So I, I, <laughs> if anybody wants to get me that for my birthday or Mother's Day, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I shouldn't have looked at that because, yeah. Uh-oh. <laughs> so it looks like the 128 gigabytes sold out for a while. So Poor Dave's wife. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I'm not going to get it. I'm good. I'll um, get it. That's okay. I'll get it. I'll get it and I'll tell you how it is. <laughs> A couple more topics I wanted to touch upon here is, um, you know, last in our last episode, we talked about the sleep phones, which I we, we, we vaguely talked about it. I didn't remember the fact that I, I actually own one. <laughs> it is the sleep phones. And, you know, it's, it's like a headband and it, and it has on the front sleep phones or the pajamas for your ears. And they are. They're so comfy. Yeah, they are comfy. But and a lot of times I, I have had to uh, get some tape and get all the fuzz that gets on this uh, headband a lot of times. Um but the only disadvantage of it is, is you got this cord coming out of the back of your head. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of times, there are times I wake up at night, I, say, oh, I can't stand this thing on my head anymore. Right. <laughs> but yeah, the nice thing too is, the and the nice thing too is it's a, it's a headband. So it goes on your, it goes on your, uh, on your head, but you also could put it over your eyes. So if you want. It's an eye mask. It's built in. Yeah, It's kind of a built in eyes mask because sometimes it, it's bright and maybe your wife or husband wants to, to watch TV and you want to listen to something to, to put you to sleep and. Um, it's a it's a great uh, it's a great device, but they do have a wireless version. And you know, you explored that a little further. And it was a little pricey. That's hundred dollars for that one. Um, There's but, even another one beyond that. That's actually I think it's like a hundred and sixty nine or something. Okay. I'll have to go double check, but it's even more. But oh my gosh, it's it would make the Apple TV like the perfect thing because <laughs> what it does is you plug in a dongle in the back of your TV. And then your spouse can watch TV while you sleep because it'll go into their ears and you won't even hear it. That was the biggest reason why I got a Roku yeah. was because I loved the fact that you could plug in headphones to the remote jack. But let me tell you, these sleep phones with the, the I, I'll have to go and look and see what they call that particular model. But uh, I think they're called uh, tele, telephones or something like that. Anyway, uh, Let's see. wow. They're awesome. <laughs> if if that would be, you know, if I won the lottery, I would be like buying a bunch of those. <laughs> that would be so much fun. So that's like a step above the sleep phones. They're wireless and it connects to your TV. So, yeah. So we'll put that on our wish list. <laughs> but yeah, it seems like it would it seems like it would it would fit all the criteria that I'm looking for. In fact, it actually even has a way better battery life than I even with like, I mean, I, I'm just asking for six hours. I think there's just like over 10 hours or something. So the battery life is stellar on it from what, from what it says in the specs. The only, only, well, besides the price, I mean, it is a bit pricey. A uh, hundred dollars is, is quite a bit to pay for something like that. But 
I can see how it would be worth it. I mean, it is a quality product. I mean, based on the wired version that we have, I mean, it's not cheap. I mean, it, it is made very, very well. I love the fact that you can wash it. You can take the, yeah. the stuff out of it and then you can throw it in the washing machine if you need to. Because, I mean, let's face it, you go, you take it on a plane trip and ugh, germs, you know. Uh, I did take mine on a plane trip, and that's what's leading me into one caveat that I have. I didn't like the fact that the volume just wasn't loud enough. Um, I did try to use them on the plane, and had the oh, volume been better, it would it would have been nicer. But I just it just wasn't there for me. So there, that's, that's why I have the Bose Quiet Comfort 15s and for for my plane rives. <laughs> ah, okay. Uh, well, those yeah. those were a bonus from from. Uh, hotel points, so I didn't have to pay for that. Those would be hard to sleep in, though, wouldn't they? Because they're like yeah, actual they are, headphones. But, but they do yeah. they, they do wonders when you're on a plane. I, 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 yeah. I won't travel without them. Um, so if, you, if we could marry those two products, that would be awesome. Yeah, it would be. I wanted to kind of touch upon an experience I actually just had just, just yesterday as we were recording this. And I've had this experience with Apple quite a bit in all the years that I've bought a lot of their products. So yesterday we went to the Apple store, and because uh, my wife's uh, silicon iPhone 6 Plus case, it, it, she had the turquoise colored case, which was cool. It was a cool color, and uh, the edges were started cracking. I mean, she only had it since like December, so it wasn't even December of twenty fifteen. So it's not even you know six months, seven months, uh, eight months, um, but that's under a year. So I was surprised. I didn't know that they actually had a year warranty on them. So we went to the store, and he says, "Oh yeah, we can exchange that, no problem." So that was that nice. was that was uh, that was pretty cool. And and you know, I told a couple other friends, and they were like like actually uh, surprised. So uh, she goes in. We we had to go to a, a another store, which was a little further away because they didn't have any in stock at the, our store. Well, of course, the turquoise model that she has no longer available. They, they, oh. they changed the color. So there is a mint version, which um, actually I thought was pretty close. But she she did look at the apricot version, which kind of looks more like orange, if you ask me. But mm-hmm. um, she put the orange one on. It's like this looks like Halloween. Yeah, because <laughs> it's because it, it, it's it's apricot, but it, it's it's got some orange to it. So yeah, I'm picky about my colors too. I like yeah. my purples, and so, I'm very picky about the purples. So she so we switched to the mint, and she was happy. But I just thought I would bring that up because you know Apple is always very good to their customers when it comes to customer service and taking care of uh, you know what's needed. You know, don't don't take advantage of them, but they don't, it doesn't hurt to ask. And a lot of times they uh, they do uh, do a very good job with that. So it never hurts to ask, especially nicely no, not at all. <laughs> the nicer you ask the better it is i've always been taken very well care of i mean i don't yeah, i don't do. particularly enjoy going to our local store because it's such a small boutique and it's usually packed in there but right. in the times that i've had to it's it's always been a positive experience and anytime i've ever had to call i mean i always i always had really good experience they've replaced equipment for me and that's always just a joy when that happens so i'm not surprised but yeah, it's always great to hear those stories so i've had I could go on with with my my uh, great experiences with Apple. So that's why we love our Apple products. That's why so we love them. <laughs> we had a couple more topics in here. I think I want to just. I mean, if you don't, you're okay, Melissa. Let's let's just sure. pick one of these because yeah. I think that if we get into both of these topics, it's going to be another long. Oh yeah, time this here. we we have a whole treasure trove of <laughs> topics that we just keep we can, on a Google up. <laughs> I think we can keep them googled up. Um, I, I'd like to tackle the the iCloud in our homes and uh, talk about the I, I, Apple ID. I've, I've Talked about that at great length uh, during my uh, iPhone special interest group that uh, uh, the uh, suburban Chicago Apple users that I that I lead, and uh, it's it's always been a topic relates to um, how you manage your Apple ID and how do you uh, uh, how do you manage all your apps and all that stuff. You, know, you Melissa, you say you you uh, you you share between your accounts, or do you have your own separate ones? So we have a mixture. I call it the his, hers, and ours approach. Like, okay. you know, if you picture uh, towels in a bathroom, you have the his and the hers. Well, we have our his and hers, and then we have our ours. <laughs> so we have each, and then we have, so it gets kind of complicated, but I'll try to simplify it. So I have my own personal Apple ID, and then I have an ID that I use just like for business purposes. Ah, okay. Uh, and then same thing. Now my husband, we, we weave Google in there too, so then we've got Google things that, take care of some of that and then we have one shared id and i'll tell you why we have that it's it's two purposes basically it's so that we can share purchases because this was way before the family share plan which i still don't use because i'm kind of afraid it'll work yeah i'm afraid it'll work what i have i like the way that i have it set up Uh, we have my dad on our 
um, our family plan with AT&T. So he uses that Apple ID also for apps. And so basically any content and any software that we purchase will be shared for any of our devices. So we only have to make that purchase that one time. So that is really, really handy. And then the other thing that I use it for is because I just have not found anything else that I like that does it as well is we use it to share contacts. Um, mm-hmm. We always have that that interesting kind of snafu of like, well, I have my my friends and my work, my work colleagues, you know, my colleagues, my friends, my family and my uh, clients. I have a whole clients group. Well, my husband doesn't need to have that all on his phone. And then the same thing for me. I don't need to have like all his teacher colleagues on my phone. So uh, what we do is we use the Apple ID that we share and I use the contacts portion of that Apple ID just to store mutual contacts that are family and mutual friends between us. And then that then will, when the boys are old enough, get shared to their phones when they're like old enough to be responsible and like, Hey, don't delete grandma, you know? Uh, so that is really handy when you want to add a new contact that is between you and your spouse. So that's what I call the, the shared plan. So that's kind of how we do it. And then and the, the kids have their own Apple IDs. Right. Uh, but again, like on their phones, then, and I hope they never change this. I really hope they never change this because right now as it is set up, you have your Apple ID that's plugged into the iCloud section in the settings for your iOS. And then there's a separate setting for App Store, iTunes and App Store. Right. And that's where we plug in the shared Apple ID on all the other devices. Yeah, I think you and I follow it pretty closely. So, I mean, I don't have kids, so there won't be a big family here, but... Uh, my wife has her own iCloud account, and I have my own iCloud account, and that's both of our devices are backed up that way. And I didn't yep. feel the need to intertwine our contacts, calendars, that kind of stuff, since I work in the business world. Um, and we have a, a single account for for purchases. So um, I'm one to like to buy uh, lots of iTunes credit. So I always have you know hundred, two hundred dollars of credit sitting on my iTunes account. So I never have to worry about. Uh, 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 having to pay for it because it's always got, I got, you know, a lot of times I buy these. <laughs> I, yeah, pretty much. Cause I buy these iTunes cards. You find out on eBay all the time that they're $80. Uh, you pay for it. It's a hundred bucks. Right. So yep. I'm, I'm buying those all the time. So, um, so we, we have that credit and then, you know, I also subscribe to Apple music and then also pay for our, 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 um, extra storage in iCloud. So it's all covered. So I don't have to worry ah. about it. So see, I can circle back to the iAllowance app because that's another thing is the kids will get, iTunes gift cards for Christmas or birthdays and stuff. Gotcha. Uh, Same with my dad, you know, so we will get gifts. Well, what do we do with that? So what we do is we redeem it using that shared Apple ID. And then I use the iAllowance app to add that as a new balance. And then every time, you know, so we just, you know, use it from, it's basically one big credit then. But, you know, the kids want to know, well, you know, you, I forked over my $25 gift card. You're not going to use it all because, of course, we'll just eat it up. So I, I use the iAllowance app to keep track of that for when the kids actually buy stuff. So it's basically a credit on their account. Even though we use right. it as a family, they get credit for it. And then they can trade that in. So let's say, for example, they have contributions that they do around the house that they'll earn money for. And then that adds up. But maybe they want to buy something and they don't have quite enough. I'll say, well, you've got that $25 gift card that you haven't used or that Amazon gift card. And I'll just, you know, I'll trade in. I'll trade you some cash towards whatever you want to purchase. And then you give me a little bit of that credit. And so that's how we use the app to track that all. Absolutely. So oh, what a twisted web we weave. It is. And that's that I always get that question all the time. And I think it's just uh, just uh, super important to keep them separate because it does cause a lot of headaches. It does. Um, but it doesn't have to. No, no, it doesn't. And um, it definitely, uh, if anything, uh, you shouldn't. Uh, you shouldn't avoid it. You should. Uh, you believe me, if you have the same IBD for everything, you're going to go crazy real quick. Um, did you have anything else you wanted to touch upon before we wrap this thing up? Well, not in this show. I think we should wrap this one up and, and save some goodies for later. You'll have to just keep tuning yeah, back in. We got a great, great ideas for future shows. Uh, one thing I'll mention is I'm I'm actually going to be attending a uh, conference tomorrow as we record this uh, Mac Tech. Uh, which is a more of a geeky, very geeky, and very more of an enterprise type uh, magazine that they publish. Uh, but uh, there's going to be some great stuff uh, at that conference uh, tomorrow, and uh, 
a lot of like I said, a lot of it's more in the enterprise. So I don't know if our audience is going to be too interested in something like that. It's not nothing any, anywhere near what what Max Doc does. Uh, so uh, there's there's always going to be always always these great conferences. We can go out there and continue to learn and continue to, to understand what what there all there is to know about technology. Uh, so uh, that that's going to be great as well. So with that, I think we're going to wrap this thing up. Put a bow on it. And let's put a bow on it. Um, <laughs> You can reach me at DaveG65 on Twitter. My name is David Ginsberg. And And I'm Melissa Davis, and you can find me online as the Mac Mommy. Just do a search for T H E M A C M O M M Y, all one word, on all social media, and you'll get me. And I also have a website, themacmommy.com. She's easy to find. Yeah. I really, we all, we both appreciate you listening to this episode of In Touch with iOS, and we hope to have you come back again for the next episode. Uh, with that, we'll talk to you later.